Hey there, and for one last time, welcome back to XCOM. My name is Pete, and yes, today we complete our final episode in this series. Our Iron Man Impossible walkthrough has already lasted quite a bit longer than a usual XCOM playthrough normally lasts, even with the Enemy Within DLC installed, but today we are bringing it to a hopefully successful conclusion. We have one more mission left to complete, as well as a plethora of achievements to unlock, and all of that could take some time, so let's jump right into the action. In the last episode, we rushed the construction process of the Gollop Chamber, so that facility should be finished before the next council report is due, and with that, our first achievement of today's episode is also right around the corner. Alright, the Gollop Chamber has been constructed and with that we have built every single facility that the game has to offer. We have also unlocked the On the Shoulders of Giants achievement, so let's take a closer look at our newly built facility and see what we can do over there. It's clear that the alien device will not respond to attempts at physical interaction. However, if we can find a soldier with strong enough psionic abilities, we may be able to activate it. Okay, it looks like we require someone with strong enough psionic abilities, perhaps someone whose abilities have been boosted in some way. In any case, that is nothing that we need to look into just yet. Keep in mind that we also still need to shoot down one more alien UFO for the Shooting Stars achievement, and as long as we don't have that, we can't embark on the final mission anyway, so the Gollop Chamber serves little purpose until then, which means the only sensible thing to do here is to keep scanning, let the Council report pass by, and then see what the next month, and with that the next year, have to offer. Incoming transmission. Excellent work, Commander. This council is pleased to see our continued support of this project has been worthwhile. We hope that your current successes only mark the beginning of an enduring effort to eliminate the extraterrestrial threat. We will be in touch, Commander. Alright, Happy New Year in XCOM as well, I guess. Let's keep scanning and see if we can't find that last UFO. You're gonna want to take a look at this, Commander. Incoming transmission from the Council. Right, so we're interrupted here by a Council mission. But you guessed it, we will ignore this one. I can promise you this, we will not see another month pass by, so panic is pretty much irrelevant at this point. The only thing we're looking for is that last alien UFO. Contact detected. And there we are, UFO number 40 is going to be a large scout. And that means the Shooting Stars achievement is just two hits with the Fusion Lands away. And there it is, it took a while but we finally have it in our grasp. For a single playthrough this is in my opinion the most annoying achievement in the game, but even that could not stop us. Now at this point we are ready for the final mission, but as you saw earlier none of our soldiers is currently able to use the Gollop Chamber, so let's do something about that and also award some medals in the process, which is actually crucial for another achievement. As you can see, we currently have one of each medal except for the Athenian Shield, of which we have two, and since that Athenian Shield improves a soldier's survivability, I think we'll put it on Andrea. Keep in mind that for the Ain't No Cavalry Coming achievement, she needs to survive every mission in the game, and that includes this last one, so by awarding her this medal, I think we improve her chances. Now, at this point, the remaining five medals all have to go on one and the same soldier. Coincidentally, that soldier will also be the one to eventually activate the Gollop Chamber, so he or she needs to be psionically gifted. Don't get this wrong though, to just activate the Gollop Chamber and trigger the final mission, no medals are necessary whatsoever. But if we want to unlock the Guardian of the Earth achievement, then we need to use a soldier for that who has been awarded all five of these. For the Star of Rohan, we actually also still need to assign a power, and since a bonus to experience points is quite literally useless at this point in the game, we are choosing the bonus to Will and Defense for the entire squad. And you may have guessed it already, the lucky recipient will be none other than Annette. She has by far the highest Will score in our entire squad, and that makes her the perfect candidate for a crucial role during this final mission. And 
And here you can see it. Five medals are shining on Annette's chest. I think it's safe to say that she is now very much highly decorated. And that leaves us with only one more thing to do. Like I said earlier, the medals are certainly not what makes one eligible to use the Gollop Chamber. A very special piece of equipment, however, is, and I think this one also wasn't too hard to guess. Of course, I am talking about the Psy Armor, so let's put that on and see if anything changes. We've done it, Commander. Dr. Valen is confident that this soldier has the power to interact with the alien device. I recommend we get started immediately. Okay, so it seems like Annette is ready. We have confirmation that the Gollop Chamber and the Ethereal Device can now finally be used, so let's do exactly that. This is it. Once our volunteer enters the chamber, there is no turning back. This is what we've been working towards this whole time. We likely will not be able to make any developments beyond this point. Dr. Valen then also makes very clear that this is the point of no return in this game. With the next click, we will not only unlock two more achievements, but also trigger the final mission. And once that happens, we only have one goal left to complete. And yes, Annette will be the one going in, playing the role of the volunteer. Again, I think she's more than up for the task. With each of our major victories, we have encountered incrementally more powerful aliens. After the first alien craft was shot down, they began a campaign of terror. The alien forces were led by a sectoid commander, a powerful psionic creature. Upon capturing the hyperwave beacon, we detected a cloaked ship carrying a being of incredible psionic power. Having captured the device it sacrificed itself to protect, an immense alien ship has now appeared within our atmosphere. We can only assume that a being of even greater psionic power is on board this vessel. We have already pushed human evolution so far, and I fear where the next step will take us. But our enemy leaves us with no other choice. A new type of weapon is required. Okay, so it looks like we have finally made contact, and with that, a new mission has become available. Assaulting the alien temple ship is now the only thing that stands between us and victory, and I think we're ready, at least we don't have anything else to take care of, and this is what we have been working towards for the last 65 episodes, so let's finally bring this series to a conclusion. Our squad will actually be the one that is displayed right here, Annette is the only one that has to come, we have no choice about that and cannot remove her. However, for achievement purposes, we also definitely want to bring along Shoji. And like I said earlier, Mech Trooper Astro Cook will have to come as well for the Ain't No Cavalry coming achievement. Having an assault and a sniper then seems sensible and we'll have Luisa and Michelle fill those roles. And for the final spot, it was a toss-up between a second sniper and a second heavy. In the end though, the ability to launch two rockets on the same turn could prove to be useful. So heavy CFD Lupi comes along as our sixth squad member. And with that, we should have everyone equipped and ready to go. So let's embark on one final mission together and assault the alien temple ship. Finally within our grasp. 
Okay, here we are, and full disclosure, I have of course played this mission before, and the map and the enemies on it are always the same. It has been a few years though, so I'm not entirely sure what we're getting into, I just wanted to mention it to make sure you know. Now, as you just saw, by bringing Shoji, we have also just unlocked the Rising Dragon achievement. That is the last one we unlock for now, everything else will follow once we hopefully win this mission. One more very important thing before we get going, you can see that Annette has now access to a brand new psionic power. The Rift ability is automatically awarded to whoever uses the Gollop Chamber, and in the right hands, meaning those of a person with a very high will score, the ability can be absolutely devastating. I'll make sure to show it off when the time comes, but for now we can start scouting. Alright, a sectoid commander and two regular sectoids are our first enemies. I would not say that that's anything to worry about, so let's get set up here. We'll use ghost armor for our two heavies, while Annette and Andrea will stay back a bit. That should put us in a good position to clear out this group with relative ease. Okay, so we have just heard a few wise words about the aliens we're about to face. That is going to be a thing throughout the entirety of this mission, so we will learn a bit about how the different enemy units came to be. In the end though, it doesn't make that much of a difference. They all have to die one way or another. Right, so we now have one enemy down and Michelle's in the zone ability has triggered. The remaining two kills, however, should be an easy job for Sharky Santoso, who can first move in for an extremely high critical hit chance against the sectoid commander, and then follow things up with a guaranteed kill against the regular sectoid. That means Palladium Talpas can still use some of her turn to move, however, by going airborne she also detects two more sectoids, and they are pretty far away, so I doubt we'll be able to do anything about them on this turn. Then again, even if they both hit their shots, that's not going to be the end of the world. Still, let's place Andrea in a bit of a bait position here. If someone gets hit, it might as well be her. Our enemies, however, do make things a bit easier for us. They are going for the mind merge, which means only one of them is taking a shot, and even better, that one misses. Okay, so we learn a bit more, this time about the Cyberdisc and the drone, of which several have apparently teleported in as backup, and these are active the moment they appear on the map, so we have to take them out right now. Good thing that we have a net and her rift ability, because the damage of that ability is calculated based on the will score difference between the attacker and the defender, and robotic units which are normally immune to psionics have a will score of zero, so this is going to hurt. And it looks like Annette is certainly arousing some interest on the alien side. Her rift ability, meanwhile, is now on a four turn cooldown, so we can't use it all that often, and you just saw why that is probably a good thing. Now, for Cyberdisc and Drone over on the other side, we can employ the services of Palladium Talpas. The drone is an easy kill, activates in the zone and leaves the headshot free to use on the cyberdisc, which results in a critical hit and, with a bit of luck, allows Luisa here to go for the kill with her pistol. X-ray neutralized. 
And that then only leaves the two sectoids, who have certainly made it a bit easier for us by mind merging, as Astro Cook now has a 97% chance to get a double kill. And there we are, that is this area cleared and at this point we want to move on. However, we don't really have that many moves left, so let's just pull up our heavies and end the turn. No alien movement then, and that means we're up again and we want to proceed through the middle here. We can just vaguely see an elevated walkway there. Unfortunately though, there is absolutely no full cover on it. So we'll have to wait one more turn for Michelle to be able to scout ahead with her mimetic skin, while Sharky Santoso can detach from the group a bit and scout out the lower areas, as those should have at least a bit of full cover available. And that concludes another turn, so let's continue with Louisa, who can now deactivate the energy field in front of her. Okay, so this time we learn a bit about the floater, of which we can see both variants, the heavy floater and the regular one. However, neither one of them has noticed us yet, so let's keep it that way for one more turn while we move everyone into a better position. Rock and roll! I'm ready. On the alien turn then, the floaters stay put and that works for us. Michelle has a guaranteed critical hit here, and I think that should be good enough for the kill. Adios. Speaking of guaranteed criticals, Luisa also has one, so let's take out the last visible enemy, nice and easy. Now thanks to In The Zone, we can actually keep scouting with Michelle, and that reveals that we are in fact dealing with a few more hostiles. And unfortunately, as Shoji makes his move here, we also activate one of them. But that shouldn't be too much of a concern. After all, he has a 90% chance to get the kill here. Out of the game. And that's another enemy down. Let's now move up the rest of our squad and end our turn. I don't think the Overwatches are going to be necessary. But as you know, in this game, it's better to be safe than sorry. And indeed, once again, no action on the alien turn, which means Palladium Talpas can once again start things off with a guaranteed kill. This activates the second floater, who now moves a bit closer, and while the hit is now no longer guaranteed, 81% seems like a shot that we should be taking. Alright, job done, at least for now, so time to keep moving. And as you can see, the temple ship is quite large, which also means that we will regularly cover a large amount of ground with very few enemies between our destinations. A curious endeavor, the search for the gift in the most unsavory of beings. They were little more than insects when their uplift began, and in their failure became the most dangerous of predators, incapable of direction, understanding. They were deemed fit only to breed and die. All right, a trio of chrysalids have appeared, and once again we learn a bit of trivia about them. Just like before though, that does not earn them any sympathies. Instead, Palladium Talpas can make the most of our two guaranteed hits. That leaves only one more and we'll ask CFD Lupi to take care of that. A 95% hit chance from above should hopefully do the trick. Right, now our way ahead lies through a barely visible door at the end of the walkway here, and we finally also have full cover available up there, so let's see what lies beyond. A valiant effort, a being of intelligence and exceptional loyalty, 
easily adapted to serve our needs. Still, despite such great hopes, they were unable to embrace the gift. Another wasted example. Okay, from the looks of it, we're facing just two Thin Man here. That is certainly nothing that should worry us too much, so let's keep moving up and prepare for the attack on the next turn. As always, our enemies stay exactly where they are, however, not for long, as Luisa now barges in. Enemy in sight. This gets our two enemies moving, but of course not out of danger. As a matter of fact, even getting behind full cover is not enough. From close range, Sharky Santoso is just that deadly. Moving up with Andrea, we unfortunately don't have a shot at the other thin man, but we can still do some damage. Collateral damage won't get us the kill, but it gets us halfway there. And you know what? We haven't done this in quite some time, so let's go old-fashioned here. A plain old grenade will now be enough to finish the job. Grenade. As we keep scouting with Luisa, we then detect another thin man on one of the walkways below. So let's stay out of sight for the rest of the turn. I don't think there is any need to make this any more complicated. Our enemy then stays put, which allows Michelle to move up stealthily, and with height and stealth advantages, the kill should be guaranteed even with just the plasma pistol. And there we go, time to continue scouting. Target confirmed, on our way. Now, the new one confronts a greater threat, a rare strength, found in an easily controlled breed. And yet, they are incapable of brilliance, of independence. They will never be more than primitive warriors, serving only to fight and die, as did those who came before them. Now, this time we learn a few things about our good friend the Muton. We have two regular ones over on the right side by Luisa here, as well as a berserker waiting in the center of the room. And for a bit of extra symmetry, we then also detect two more mutons over on the left side. All taken together, that is starting to approach the territory of a challenging group of enemies. Luckily though, we have all the time in the world, which means we can set up our ambush with care. Ammunition loaded. On the next turn then, it is time to strike and we'll actually do that from far away, as Michelle has a high chance for a headshot from the back. Shoji, meanwhile, is in a very similar situation concerning the two mutons over on the right, and he succeeds as well, trimming our enemy numbers down to three. Following that, we have CFD Lupai with a good shot against the Berserker. And the hit here pretty much guarantees that we will be able to clear this group out. Because Kim did not move on this turn, she can now also still use her Mind Fray against the Muton on the left here. That brings it down to 5 hit points, just enough for a second Mind Fray from Annette to finish the job. I have a special nightmare just for you. The Berserker, meanwhile, can be punched out of existence by Astro Cook. Ready to engage. And thanks to rapid fire, Luisa now has two guaranteed flanking shots against the last Muton. And there we are, all enemies have been defeated and the alien turn passes by uneventfully. Which brings us to our next objective. Up ahead we can see some sort of balcony overlooking an area below, and I don't think that I have to mention that that would be a fantastic position for us, so let's start moving towards it. Since the balcony itself only offers half cover, we'll have to use Michelle for the scouting, and she is still quite a bit of distance away, so this will take a turn or two. Let's rock. On the bright side though, we are in absolutely no hurry to complete this mission, which arguably makes it quite a bit easier compared to the plethora of terror missions that lie behind us, not to mention that most of the enemies so far have also been on the weaker side. An artifact. 
artificial warrior, created to supplement the limitations of the many failures. Crafted with a singular purpose, it ultimately contributes little to our cause. Still, there is hope as a new one approaches. Alright, eventually then we get a glimpse of what lies below, and greeting us is the familiar sight of two sector parts, so let's prepare for the ambush and not reveal ourselves just yet. When do I get to shoot an alien? We can then begin our next turn with a disabling shot against the sector pot in the back. The hit is guaranteed after all, and the other one actually moves towards us, which should make it a bit easier to either get the kill or potentially disable it as well with Andrea. However, for now we are actually going for the kill. A high percentage shot from Shoji here finds its target and activates holo targeting, and that gives Heavy Lupi up on the balcony two 90% shots, and she also does extra damage against robotic units, so making them both could be very important. Alright, and that should actually seal the deal. The absolute least amount of damage that Luisa can do here is 4 points, and the hit is not only guaranteed but free, which means she can move in and then back out again. Headed there now. Moving Shoji down from the balcony has also cleared a path for Andrea to drop down, and the sector pod's 9 remaining hit points are just enough for her kinetic strike module. Alright, Shoji and Andrea have both taken some damage, but that's nothing to be concerned about yet. Instead, we might as well take a shot with a net here, just to make our next turn a tiny bit easier. With its main gun disabled, the sector part is then not really capable of much, so let's take aim with Palladium Talpus again and go for the headshot. That results in a critical hit and we can once again follow that up with Shoji, and he does in fact connect again, however the holo targeting was actually the main thing I was looking for. The improved hit chance now once again gives Kim two excellent shots from up above, let's see if that's enough for the kill. Now unfortunately it isn't, but Luisa can quickly take care of the rest. Again, four points of damage is her minimum output, so one shot is enough to guarantee us the kill. Right, now somewhat inconveniently, two Muton Elites have spawned in, however our turn is nearing its end, and they also don't have any line of sight yet, so let's get Luisa back into safety and then use Andrea's restorative mist ability, which can now heal her, Luisa and Shoji as well. The mutants meanwhile both go on overwatch and with that don't really give us that many options. I am actually not quite sure why we can see them at the moment, after all we don't have line of sight. Moving up Sharky Sentoso does at least change that, apart from that however there is really not much we can do, so let's be patient and see if they make a mistake. Alright, one Muton is on the move and Michelle's reaction shot is on the way. She deals 9 points of damage and probably due to the distance we don't receive any counterfire. At this point though, I think we can go for the attack. Sharky Sentoso can use a run and gun to move in and not only give us visibility but also take two flanking shots against one of the enemies. And with the first one being a critical, the second one should be enough for the kill. Heavy Astro Cook can then move up, still doesn't get line of sight, but can use her collateral damage ability. That gets rid of the Muton's cover, but more importantly gets it to below 10 hit points. Enough for a double mind fray to do the rest. 
That is, if we're not stupid and forget that enemies can go on Overwatch, as Annette here gets hit with a full barrage. Now, that is unfortunate, but then again, not enough to kill her. That is still very much our job in this mission. So here goes the first mind fray, and then Shoji can follow things up with number two. Can you feel the pressure? Your nightmare is just starting. Two more dashes from Kim and Michelle then bring our turn to an end. We also don't see any more surprise enemy reinforcements on the alien turn. And so it is now time to slowly but steadily move towards the bridge. During her initial scouting attempt, Luisa does not encounter any hostiles. But if you look closely, then you can already see that what lies ahead of us might be a bit of a special area. Not to mention that there are several of these pods on the sides, which appear to be housing some creatures. Creatures that look very familiar to ethereals. So let's keep that in mind as we advance here. Once again, we'll likely need two turns to get ready. But as I said earlier, we are in no rush. And with whatever lies ahead, it might also be a smart idea to patch up a net at this point. I don't think I have mentioned this yet, but if she dies, we actually fail the mission, as she is the one who has established the psionic link with the aliens. Now our next turn is here and we can continue to advance until we get to Heavy Kim Lupai and things start to get really interesting. Contact. Behold the greatest failure of the Imperial Ones. We who failed to ascend as they thought we would. We who were cast out, we who were doomed to feed on the gift of lesser beings, as we sought to uplift them, to prepare them for what lies ahead. Alright, I don't think I'm spoiling anything if I say that this is the final fight of the mission. Two ethereals, two muton elites and a very special ethereal with 30 hit points. Yes, I think it is very clear that this is the alien's last stand. Still, there is no need to panic as there is a, well, relatively easy solution to all of this. I'm not going to tell you what it is just yet, but suffice it to say there is no need to take any unnecessary risks here. So as long as we are out of sight, we'll keep it that way. On the next turn then, we will attack in full force. Ready to rock. Now, this is a bit inconvenient. As you have seen, the boss ethereal, which is actually called the uber ethereal, has moved and we don't have a line of sight at the moment. Now, for what I have planned, we don't necessarily need that, but it would make things a lot more risky because we want to, or better yet have to, kill this ethereal on this turn. So despite coming under double reaction fire, we are moving up with Andrea here. Unfortunately for her then, both shots actually also connect and in one swift motion she loses 16 hit points. What's even worse is that despite all that, she still doesn't see our enemy yet. So it looks like we'll have to get her right into the middle of things. And there it is, actually a bit further over to the left than I would have guessed. So in hindsight, this was not a bad choice, I'd say. Our next move is then also rather easy. Heavy CFD Lupi has a clear shot with her shredder rocket. Andrea herself is just outside of the blast zone. So let's open fire. Firing rocket. Now, at this point, I feel like I can mention that killing our special friend will be enough to end the mission and win the game. 
However, as you can see, that endeavor is running into a slight problem, because Andrea's scouting efforts have made it impossible to hit it with a second rocket without hurting our mech trooper. Also keep in mind that if we accidentally kill her, the Ain't No Cavalry Coming achievement would be lost, which we can of course not let happen. However, Andrea possesses two absolutely crucial abilities for the situation, namely damage control and absorption fields. Absorption fields make sure that she never suffers more than 8 points of damage or 33% of her maximum health from a single hit, which alone already ensures her survival here, but for the next two turns damage control reduces that amount by a further two points, which means that yes, Andrea can literally stand right inside of the blast zone and still survive while the aliens around her suffer. Now, as you can see, our special friend is down to 6 hit points, and wouldn't it be convenient and also awfully poetic if Annette's will score was just a tiny bit higher than that of the ethereal, so that, combined with the damage bonus from the Shredder Rocket, her newly acquired rift ability does exactly those 6 points of damage? Oh yes, I think that would indeed be very convenient. This is not your path, not your purpose. You need our guidance, slow this power. Without us, what are you? And here we are, after 66 episodes we have achieved an impossible victory. Our XCOM Enemy Within Iron Man Impossible walkthrough has come to an end and we are now receiving a ton of achievements, everything we have worked so hard for is finally paying off after a final mission that could have barely gone any smoother. So as we can now soak in our completionist success and take a look at some of the statistics the game provides us, I want to say thank you for your continued support during this series. I know that especially the last few episodes during which we grinded for the Shooting Stars achievement were not always the most enjoyable to watch, but for the most part you stuck with me even through that, so that today we can finally celebrate our victory together. 
And that really means a lot to me, because back when I started this series, I wasn't really sure how well XCOM would perform on this channel. I had a vague idea that there could perhaps be an audience for it, but it was also to some extent a shot in the dark. So now, having reached the end of our journey, I'm very happy to see that it paid off. Now, at this point, many of you will probably wonder about the future of XCOM on this channel. And of course, XCOM 2 is eventually going to happen. However, after 66 episodes, I think we all have earned ourselves a bit of a break. After all, there are quite a few other games out there that I think you might enjoy as well. So perhaps I am going for another one of those shots in the dark very soon. However, for today, let's not worry too much about that. Instead, let's be happy that my very ambitious plan for this series did actually work out. There were moments during the first 10 to 15 episodes or so where I really had my doubts about that, but in the end we succeeded and achieved full completion. So as we watch the credits roll and appreciate all of the people who worked on this great game, there really isn't all that much left for me to say. So let's end it the way we always do. I hope you enjoyed our run as well as today's finale, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can subscribe to stay up to date and find out first what we're playing next. You can of course also grab some merchandise over on shop.peatcomplete.com or you could also check out and maybe even pledge to the Peat Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.